Chapter 7, we'll go to verse 13 and 14 here in just a moment. And Francis told me yesterday, she said, you've been doing good all year, talking a little bit slower. So your prayers have been answered, uh, Francis, Lucy, you've been helping out with that prayer life, I know that. And so, uh, so I've been talking a little bit slower. Brian will be very pleased when I give Brian a report that uh, everybody said I've been talking a little bit slower. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. I think I have enough time to talk about two verses today, okay? All right. Hey, let me welcome our online crowd. We love you. We appreciate you tuning in from all over the world. And, uh, and y'all just let our online crowd know how much you appreciate them tuning in here today because it really is important to us that they do that. And not only do we have them here from all over the country, but we even have them here from Africa. Can you believe that? People from Africa will tune in. And, uh, and listen, all the way from Ghana and all over the place, Bob, it's amazing. And God, what he's doing, he's drawing them in because he wants them to hear the word. So he's going to draw people in from all over the world. And I really feel like time is running out. And so we've got to do all we can to get the gospel out, John. It's so important that we do that. So our online crowd, we love you. We appreciate you tuning in. And uh, just go ahead and uh, say hello. Don't be afraid to communicate. We're not going to bug you. We're not going to text you. We're not going to send nothing to your house. We just want to know that you're on here. So tell us where you're watching from. If you're new, just say that you're new. All right, but Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, there at home, get your Bibles open up as well, because God can speak to somebody, not only here on campus, but He can speak to them there online, and so it's really, really important that they do that, all right? So Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 here in just a moment. Today we begin the seventh and final section of what we call a Sermon on the Mount, the seven main sections that Jesus talks about here in this in this sermon, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. We've been going verse by verse. If you missed any of those, Lewis put them up on our YouTube channel. You can check them all out. But we come to the seventh and final section uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. And over the next four weeks, we're going to examine this section uh, titled, The Choices of a Disciple. And what God's going to do, He's going to present us with two choices that we have to make uh, in four different categories over the next four weeks. And Jesus reveals that we must make these choices. Nobody can make these choices for us. We have to make them ourselves. And he says that we're going to, in verse 13 and 14, we'll look at here in a moment today, we're going to be looking at two paths, or two, two ways that are presented before us. Uh, one road leads to heaven, one road leads to hell. And then next week we're going to take a look at two different kinds of fruits, or teachers, the good and the bad. And then we're going to look at, in verses 21 to 23, we'll pick up on this one on Christmas morning, and it's going to be two professions. And one of the scariest verses in all the Bible. We're going to take a look at that in great detail. The true uh, profession, those who are truly born again, and those who claim to be born again, but Jesus told them, depart from me. I never knew. You know, words, they weren't born again. What John told us to do this morning, get born again. And then we're going to close out uh, this series in verses 24 to 29 by looking at two foundations. And Jesus said that there was two groups of people there, and everybody heard what he had to say. But he said one of the groups, what they did was they built their life on the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. But the others chose to go another path. And what they did was they built their life on the sinking foundation of this worldly system. And so he says they each built their life on one or the other. One stood, one did not. So we got that to look forward to over the next month. John Oxenham, in his poem, The Ways, he wrote, To every man there openeth a way and ways in a way. And the high so climbs the highway, and the low so gropes the low. And in between on misty flats the rest drift to and flow. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low, and every man decideth the way his soul shall go. Uh, in a British cemetery, there is this inscription written on one of the tombstones there. It says, pause, my friend, as you walk by, for as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare, my friend, to follow me. But then somebody else came along and they wrote this inscription on the bottom. To follow you is not my intent until I know which way you went. <laughs> I want to know too. Well, all throughout Scripture, uh, people were challenged to choose between the road that leads to God and the road that leads to hell. Moses challenged the people back in his day. Joshua presented a challenge before the people. Elijah and Jeremiah also made challenges. And now Jesus, likewise, presents us with a challenge, and he gives us two roads and demands that all of us make a choice. Now, by the way, to not make a choice is to choose to reject Jesus. So you might just say, well, I don't really want him today, but maybe I'll check him out tomorrow. What you're saying is, I'd rather die and go to hell 
that surrender my life to you today. So we are making a choice no matter what we do. And so may God help us to choose wisely as we examine this subject this morning. Which way will you go? Which way will you go? I know which way I'm going. The question is, which way will you go? Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Let's stand together all over the building. When your Bible's opened up, whatever form you got it, if you don't have one, it's up on the screen for you. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. You follow along as I read, because these now are the words of our Lord Jesus. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Let's pray together. Our great and wonderful King, we thank you so much for stirring our hearts here today. Through our life group, through our time of fellowship at breakfast, through the songs, and now through your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit be our guide here this morning as we examine these two paths. And Father, we pray that by the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, you'd help us to choose wisely. If there's anybody who's on the wrong path, the wide road leading to destruction, Lord, I pray you'd help them to turn around and head towards Jesus. Father, would you save every lost soul in here today? Anybody listen to my voice all around the world, Lord, online, would you help them to find their way to Jesus? And Father, would you help anybody who's walking at a guilty distance to repent and come back home? Father, with anybody with a burden on their heart, would you help them to lay it down at the foot of the cross and not to worry, but to trust in you to take care of that matter? Father, would you speak? Would you help us to obey? For well, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Well, just two simple thoughts for you, and you can take a look on the back of your bulletin and fill in the blanks. I would encourage you to do so. If not, just draw some, some pictures or do something, but stay awake. Because I want to talk to you about the road that leads to hell. One road leads to hell. It's not a subject you hear a whole lot about in churches today. But Jesus talks about it. In fact, he talked twice as much about hell as he did about heaven. So it's very important that we go verse by verse through books of the Bible like we're doing here with the Sermon on the Mount and covering everything in its proper context. In looking at this uh, broad road leading to hell, Jesus talks to me about the destructive trail. So there's a warning here about the destructive trail. Look what he says there in verse 13. The second half of it, he says, For the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. Now, many people think that all roads lead to heaven. You ever heard that statement? Well, Jesus reveals that all but one lead to hell. The Bible consistently shows that life is like a conveyor belt. You ever been on a conveyor belt? You don't have to do anything. All you got to do is just stand there and it'll carry you. Maybe you've been to the airport. And you say, I don't feel like walking and carrying this luggage, so I'm just going to put it down. I'm going to get on this conveyor belt. And all you got to do is just stand there and it'll carry you to where you want to go. And life is like that. We are all rushing headlong towards eternity. And our time is going to run out eventually. Uh, whether we live a little, little while, a few years, or like Miss Betty last night, got 91 and still counting. Some people get more years than others. Uh, but all of us are rushing headlong towards eternity. There's nothing we can do to stop it. It's going to happen, no matter what we do. And so we are on this. But the tragedy is we are placed on this conveyor belt called life heading towards eternity and we're heading towards hell from the moment of our birth. And we have to do something about it. And I'm going to tell you what you can do about it here in a minute. So in verse 13 he says, uh, but the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. So there is plenty of room on this easy road. I wrote down several observations concerning this, this wide gate. You can either write them down or you can just wait and then uh, Lewis will put them all for you on our uh, teaser later on. But listen to these, these thoughts concerning the wide gate. Number one, I wrote down, there are no hindrances to entering it in. So as I told you, we're on a conveyor belt and we're already going to head that way. You don't have to do anything but be born to head into this wide and broad gate. That's all you got to do, be born. Number two, there are plenty of people on this road. We talked about that in our life group this morning. How a majority of the people are not going to embrace what Jesus told them to do this morning. And so Jesus talked to us this morning in our life group, and John walked us through it beautifully, four different types of soil, speaking about the hearts. 
and only one of the hearts was a born-again Christian. The other three, for various reasons, did not embrace the gospel message and did not embrace Christianity and Jesus Christ, and therefore, they did not have a personal relationship with Jesus, the only way to get into heaven. And, and so there's plenty of people on this, this broad road. And they even encouraged many others to join them. And since this gate and the road are both so uh, popular, it seems to be the right way. You ever been traveling somewhere and everybody seems to be going a certain way? You say, well, this must be the way to go. You just start following the crowd. You don't know where they're going. You don't know if the one leading that crowd knows where he's going. But you say, everybody's going this way. This must be the right way. So everybody is on this broad road, heading toward this broad gate, and society and mankind in general just simply say, this must be the right way to go, because everybody else is going that way. And so there's a danger then, following the crowd. It appears to be the only gate because it's so popular. As a result, the traveler doesn't even suspect that there may be another gate, let alone look for one. He said, why would there be another gate around here when everybody's heading this way? That must be the way to go. And so because of that, they follow the crowd. Number four I wrote down, the wide gate is wide enough to include everybody. There are very few rules and restrictions on this particular path. Anything goes on this path. Any religion will do. Any God will do. And even no God at all will do on this path. People say, you, you Christians are so narrow-minded, you feel like you're the only way to get in. And you feel like only those people that are church members are going to get in. I could take it a step further. I don't think a majority of the church members are going to get in. And I'm going to talk to you about that on Christmas. Because Jesus is going to say to me, John, be careful now, because many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. So they're professing Christians. Jesus is my Lord. Then they're going to start talking about all the good things they did. Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we perform miracles? Uh, did you ever cast out a demon? I never did. I've seen some demon-possessed people. I've never cast out a demon. You ever perform a miracle? I never performed a miracle. And these folks said they did all of that stuff. And they were preachers. I preached some sermons, uh, but I've never cast out a demon or performed a miracle. And Jesus said, these people are going to come to him on Judgment Day and say they did all these things. He's going to say, that's great. The only problem is those things don't save you. That's right. That's right. So you got to come back two weeks. I'll tell you more about it. So any religion or God will do on this broad path. Do you know that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world? And in the United States. The fastest growing religion in the entire world. Islam. Hinduism. A lot of Hindus over there in, in India. Fast growing religion. And, and do you know that the Hindus have 320 million gods? Did you know that? They got more gods than we got people living in this country. And they got a god that's just about everything. And you know why they won't eat the cows over there? Because they think that might be grandma who came back reincarnated. And so they're, they're just confused over there. So any religion will do, any God will do, whatever you want, it's all good. Uh, even no God at all. Atheists will say there is no God. It promotes self-indulgence. Sin is uh, tolerated and even encouraged on this particular path. And holiness is optional and even discouraged. They don't want anybody on this path talking about holiness. They say, we don't want to talk about all that. We don't want to talk about all that. Hey, you ever try to talk to your friends? And they say, ah, you Jesus freaks, Bible thumpers, we don't care about all that. You know? And then what they'll do is they'll find somebody who's not living so good, and especially if that person professes to be a Christian. Well, I know a guy, and he says he's a Christian, and I'm going to tell you something, if that guy's getting in, I'm going to get in. Well, they say, oh, I used to go to church, but I found too many hypocrites down there to church. Therefore, I don't go any longer. If those bunch of hypocrites are going to get in, I'm going to get in too. And so holiness is optional and pretty much discouraged. Well, what does somebody look like who's on this broad path leading to destruction? Because Paul helped us out. And he says, let me tell you what somebody's going to look like so that you'll know if uh, maybe you're on this path or somebody you know is on this path. Listen to what he said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. He said, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. He's saying, what a lost person looks like is going to be pretty obvious. So you will know a lost person if they look like this. Then he says, Here, here's what their deeds are. Here's how their, their character, their lifestyle, here's the way they behave, their actions. 
immorality, impurity, sensuality. The first three things he lists are sexual sins. It's a major problem all over the world, but especially here in America today. Then he goes on to say idolatry, sorcery. And then he gets into some that we would consider maybe not such a big deal. And he says enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. We're living in a very angry culture. Yes. And I think social media has kind of promoted some of that stuff because people just run their mouths on social media, don't have to look somebody in the eyes, and so they just type in some keyboards. And then he says disputes, dissensions, factions. I mean, we, we got entire families that are divided, friendships that are divided. I mean, it really got crazy a few years ago when the election was going on. If you voted for somebody else, then other than what your friends voted for, they wanted to throw you out of the house. Right. And there was a division over the COVID. One got the vaccine, one didn't get the vaccine. If they used to disagree with the person that did or didn't, then they wanted to throw you out of the house. And, and families were divided over these two subjects in particular. And so he says there's factions, there's dissensions, there's envy, there's drunkenness, there's carousing. And then he says, by the way, I don't have time because y'all won't listen long enough. But then he says, and things like these. He said, this is not an exhaustive list. But, but things like these types of things I've already listed. If you see somebody who's displaying this kind of character, these are the deeds of the flesh, of a lost person, of a person who's not on the way to heaven. And he says, and this is the reality. And then, because Paul was a good preacher, he says, of which I forewarn you. He said, I'm warning you about these things. So he's talking to the church of Galatia. And he says, just as I have forewarned you. He said, I warned you about it in the past, and I feel so deeply burdened about it, I'm going to warn you about it again. Yeah. So he said, Pastor John, why do you preach so, so fervently and so adamantly? Because I am desperate to get as many people in heaven as I can get them, get them in there. And so that's why. Because I'm going to give an account on Judgment Day for what I've shared behind this sacred desk. Right. You're going to give an account for what you've done with it. And that's why we have in our life groups the Word of God is being proclaimed very clearly. I'm telling you, you're going to get better Bible teaching in your life groups than you're going to get from most of the pulpits in America. And then he says, I already warned you about it. I'm, I'm still going to warn you again because I'm so deeply burdened about some of the folks. Wait a minute now. He's writing to the church at Galatia. He's not writing to the people down there at the bar. He's not writing, writing to the Muslims and the Hindus. He's writing to those who say, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the church. He said, I warned you guys, and I'm warning you again because I'm concerned that some of y'all are not right with the Lord. And then he says that those who practice such things, it's not that you stumble once in a while, you get angry once in a blue moon, or, or you did something wrong one time. He says this is a lifestyle. This is the way these people live. They're always angry. You ever know anybody say, well, good night, don't talk to them right now. I mean, they fly off the handle. Well, wait until they have their cup of coffee before you talk to them in the morning, or they'll fly off the handle. If this is their character and their lifestyle, he says, you are not born again. He says, don't deceive yourself. He says, those who practice such things, this is your lifestyle, this is the way you are, you do this all the time, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. Say, Pastor John, help me out there. What does that mean? It means you're not going to heaven. So he says, if your lifestyle looks like this, you are one of those individuals on the broad road leading to destruction. And so he said, you got to be careful because I warned you about it and I'm warning you again. And, and I've warned you about it now for chasing down seven years. So those who travel this road oftentimes don't even notice the many warning signs. So God in his mercy and his grace... What he does, he provides warning signs. You ever been driving down a road and there's a warning sign up? Hey, don't keep on driving down this road. The road's closed. There's construction up ahead. One lane road. Be prepared to stop. And there's warning signs that where you keep on going, you're going to get into an accident. You're going to hurt yourself. So what are some of the warning signs? Well, first of all, there's God's Spirit. You know what he does? He convicts us of sin. In fact, Jesus said that's one of his primary functions there in John chapter 16, verse 7 through 11. And what he's saying is the Holy Spirit is designed and his main function is to convict lost people of their sinfulness. And then when you get saved and you start drifting, he says, get back on course. You, you have it in your car. If you start drifting, there's a lane change. 
And when it'll beep, 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 that means you're drifting into the other lane. Now, some of y'all probably did what I did, and you shut it off because you got tired of it beeping at you. But there's a Holy Spirit. And what's going to happen is sometimes we shut the Holy Spirit off. Say, well, don't go back down to that church because I'm going to tell you what, they're going to preach the word down there and you're going to fall into deep conviction. Well, don't get plugged into that life group because then what's going to happen is you're going to fall into deep conviction. It's amazing how many people say to me, have you been checking out my Facebook this week? Have you been talking to my friends? Because I felt like you were speaking right directly to me. I said, I just throw it out there and the Holy Spirit, you know what he does? He puts it right there in the heart. Well, they'll say, preacher, you stepped on my toes this morning. And I'll always say, I'm sorry that I missed. I was aiming for your heart. <laughs> you get your toes stepped on, you'll get over real fast. You get your heart pierced by the Holy Spirit, you'll get right with God. Yep. So the Holy Spirit, thank God for the Holy Spirit. On July 27, 1997, when I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ to be my personal Lord and Savior, it was because of the Holy Spirit's conviction. I didn't know at the time because I didn't know anything about my Bible. But now I know. It was the Holy Spirit telling me, John, uh, you better get right with me right now. And I remember, I was in a revival. Remember, I grew up in a Catholic church. In a Catholic church, we didn't have any come forward invitations. And so I was there, and I said, oh, but what if it's going to happen? Revival, the place is packed if I'm the only one that goes forward. And God said to me, John, don't worry about what these people think about you. You better worry about me. But you know what I found out when I, went, when I did go forward? Nobody said, well, look at that no good, dirty sinner. You know what they did, Bob? They got excited. They hugged my neck. They clapped for me. They did the same thing we did for Matthew a couple weeks ago. That's right. And so thank God for the Holy Spirit bringing conviction upon us. Don't, don't ignore the Holy Spirit when he's talking to you. Because what will happen is that voice will get so faint, you'll stop hearing him. Right. You'll stop hearing him. Right. Well, then there's God's scriptures that also is another warning sign. So the Bible reveals the plan of salvation. We have it on the back of our business cards. The Roman road, the plan of salvation. And so the Bible tells me that I need to be saved. It tells me how I can be saved. So I wouldn't even know that I had to be saved unless the Bible told me that. That, that John, you have violated all of the Ten Commandments, and because you violated all the Ten Commandments, you're a, you're a sinner, you're a criminal. And so when a, when a person's in court, the judge is going to read off to him, here's what you're being charged with. He has to know. When a cop arrests you, he has to tell you why you're being arrested. He'll say, here's why I'm arresting you. Or here's why I pulled you over. And he's going to list the problems and the reasons. Because you were speeding, you went through a stop sign, whatever you did wrong. He's going to talk to you about all of that. And he's going to say, this is the reason why. And you broke the law. And because you broke the law, here's the consequence of breaking that law. Well, the Bible tells me what the consequence is of breaking God's law. And so as I read my Bible, then, the, then he tells me. But then there's God's servants. God places servants in your life and in my life. So for me, it was Bo Reed. On the night that I got saved, Bo Reed was one preaching the revival. It was Larry Summers, who was the pastor of the church, who when I went forward, he started talking to me. Larry Leonard, my good buddy, just went on to be of glory. He is now where I long to be, Gene. And he is there in glory right now. He just passed away a week ago. He poured his life into me and mentored me and discipled me. And he taught me the urgency of the Great Commission. And he said, John, we've got to get out there. We've got to get the gospel to everybody. This is the guy that we were over there on the Sea of Galilee, standing on the shoreline, that he is witnessing the two Chinese guys who turned out to be a couple of missionaries, but he didn't know that. He said, here's a couple of guys I may never see again from China. I want to give them the gospel. And so this is the guy that poured into my life and mentored me. Well, flip over to chapter 23. So you're there in chapter 7. Go over to chapter 23. And let's take a look at some of these servants that God's going to give to us. So this is mercy and grace. He's, he's presenting people to help you. So you found it, say amen. You still look and say, hold on. Good, everybody found it. Look at verse 29. Matthew chapter 23, verse 29. It says, woe to you. Woe is a judgment. When you see that woe, and he, and he provides a bunch of them here to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the elite. They were like the spiritual elite. These are the guys supposed to know who God is and how to find God. But yet Jesus is rebuking them. And he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites. Wow, good. Now you think I preach hard. For you are like whitewashed tombs. And... Uh, 
For you, you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. So, so they're saying, we love the prophets. We love Isaiah. We love Jeremiah. We love all these guys. Sure you do. Look at verse 30. And say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, back in the Old Testament, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Well, we would have never killed God's servants if he had sent them to us. That's what they're saying. So then Jesus says to them, verse 31, So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Good night. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers. How will you escape the sentence of hell? Good night. I mean, can you hear the anger in Jesus? You know why he's so angry with them? Because they're supposed to be helping the people find God. But they're a bunch of religious hypocrites. They don't know who God is themselves. They're going to end up crucifying the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah who came to save them, and they end up crucifying Him. And so they had a problem with Jesus every step of the way because He didn't do things the way they, they, they wanted Him to do things. So He didn't lift them up and, and brag on them, and He hung out with the lowly people, He hung out with the sinners, and He had the testimony that He was a friend of sinners and tax collectors. He said, this guy hangs out with gluttons and drunkards. He said, yeah, because I came to Help those who are sick. A doctor ought to be hanging out with sick people, not healthy people. So I came here to help lost people find their way to salvation. So then he, then he gets on to them there. And he calls them, you serpents. Wow, good night. Can you imagine the, the look on their face when they're hearing this rabbi, this preacher telling them this stuff? Sometimes I feel like I'm too soft in my preaching. So then he says in verse 34, Therefore, because of all of those things, because you're a bunch of hypocrites, and because you say that you wouldn't have killed the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the rest of them, he said, Behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. And he says, I'm going to give you a second chance. So you already messed up back then. You know you messed up. But I'm, I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to send you somebody else. And hopefully you'll listen this time. But then Jesus knows the future. So he already said to them, Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. I'm going to send you people that are going to try to help you out and find your way to Christ, find your way to salvation. What you're going to do is you're going to persecute them. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Wow. So then he says, uh, I'm sending you these people. And of course that would be the disciples and that would be all the people he sent out down the line. That would be me that he's sending to you right now trying to help you out. That'll be John and Lewis that are in our life groups sharing the Word of God, trying to help you out. Uh, that'll be guys like Billy Graham and Charles Spurgeon and D.O. Moody and Adrian Rogers and Johnny Hunt and all the greats that are sharing the gospel out there week in and week out all over the world and, and mass crusades and one-on-one -on -one with people. And he said, I'm sending all these people to you, these lowly missionaries you don't know anything about, in these jungles in Africa, and in communist China, and in Hindu India, and in Muslim nations all around the world. I'm sending them out there. He says, but the majority of people will not receive what they have to say. Wow. They ignore the warning signs and just keep on driving by. So travelers on this road wander aimlessly toward hell, denying the very important truth of Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. Well, it must be the right way. Everybody's going this way. You Christians can't have the only lock on salvation. Well, Jesus moves us from the destructive trail, back there in Matthew chapter 7, to the deceived traveler. There's a deceived traveler. So look what he said there in verse 13. He said, For the way, the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, leads towards hell. And notice what he said about it. And there are many who enter through it. Many. Now he's going to use this word a few times as he's talking about these two different choices. And the indication in the Greek language, the Greek language is what the New Testament was written in, so you have to go back to the original language. And the indication in the Greek language, the difference between many and few, is that a majority of the people are on that path. Hardly anybody is on the other path. We'll get to them in a minute. But the majority of people are on this path. Do you know that the majority of the world is lost? So they say that 2 billion people, there's a little, almost chasing down 8 billion people on the earth today. 
and they say two billion of them claim to be Christians. But they lump a lot of people in that Christianity that are not born again Christians. Like Mormons, they are not born again Christians. They have a false Jesus. They say that Jesus and Satan are brothers. That's completely false. It's a lie from the pit of hell. They say that Jesus was a man who became a God, but the Bible clearly states that God was a, was a, Jesus was a God who became a man. That's right. That's right. So they got the opposite. And they also think that one day they can become a God themselves. We were not going to become gods. So Mormonism, the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, is a lie from the pit of hell. Right. Yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses will come and knock on your door, and they will tell you that they have an inside track to getting into heaven. Uh, they also lie and are deceived because they have a false Jesus who is not found nowhere in the Bible. So all of these people that claim to be born-again Christians, they're lost. And I told you before that Billy Graham estimated 80% of the church is lost. Maybe he got that number from the parables where three-fourths of them, 75%, were lost. And so majority of people who claim to be born again, and Jesus is going to say, be careful of those who say, Lord, Lord, and I'm going to tell them, depart from me, I never knew you. It's not that they lost their salvation, they never had it in the first place. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so he be careful about that. And so majority of the person lost. Well, wait a minute, now, who are they? Who are the people on this road to destruction? These deceived people who think they're deceived, but are not. They are people from all walks of life, various cultures and ages. There are sweet little old ladies who are very nice and very helpful. There are men who work hard, provide for their families. Uh, they are people from every background, every race, every walk of life, every nationality, every socioeconomic group. They're basically every single person who is without Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior is one of these people. Listen to what Warren Wiersbe said about it. He said, here then is the first test. So how do I know if I'm a born-again Christian? He's going to help me out. Did your profession of faith in Christ cost you anything? If not, then it was not a true profession. Many who trust Jesus Christ never leave the broad road with all its appetites and associations. They have an easy Christianity that makes no demands on them. Yet Jesus said that the narrow way was hard. We cannot walk on two roads in two different directions at the same time. That's a good word. What did we learn in our life group this morning? Did we not learn that Jesus said, if you're truly born again, there'll be some fruit in your life? But the other people, they said, well, I'm born again. But then after a little while, they said, man, this Christianity thing is not so easy. I'm out of here. Then they said, hey, this Christianity thing, I found out I can't get rich, and God's not some divine butler up in the sky who wants to give me a brand new house and a brand new Cadillac, so therefore I'm out of here. You say, well, Pastor John, what about good people, though? Aren't good people going to get in? Well, I got some good news and I got some bad news. The good news is every single good person will get in. If you know anybody who's good, tell them not to worry at all because they are guaranteed to get in. So what's the bad news? Well, let me let my buddy Apostle Paul give you the bad news. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have all become useless. Listen now. There is none who does good. Could you help me out, Paul? There is not even one. Wow. So yeah, if you're a good person, you'll be guaranteed to get in. The problem is you're not a good person. And there was only one who was good. And cute little baby Jesus grew up, lived a sinless life, went to the cross to pay the sin debt so you and I could become good. Yeah. So God makes those who are no good become good so they can do good. So Paul summarizes it in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He said, every good person will get in. The problem is, there's not one good person out there. Not one. And the reason why we like to talk about how good we are is because we're arrogant. And we downplay the standards of God. Well, I'm, I'm not that bad. I mean, you know, I'm not Hitler. I mean, I hadn't murdered nobody. Uh, well, have you ever told a lie? Because my Bible says that all liars have their part in the lake of fire. Yeah. And by the way, Jesus said that all lies come from the devil, who is the father of lies. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. He doesn't just tell the truth. He is the truth incarnate. Yeah. 
He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so Jesus said, you just tell a lie, you're out of here. Well, that's the bad road leading to the bad place. What about the good road leading to the good place? So one road leads to hell, but there's another road. And notice the road that leads to heaven. The road that leads to heaven. And acknowledging this road, I see the difficult trail. Notice the difficult trail there in verse 14. He says, the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, leads to heaven. Unlike the broad road to hell, this road is narrow, and it is hard to find. The other one is big and wide and obvious, occupied by a lot of people, very easy to find. Already put on that road, don't have to do nothing but just be born. You're already on that road. But we must be determined in our search. But the good news is, Jeremiah 29, 13, God guarantees us, you will seek me and find me. So if you look for me, you're going to find me. He said, when you search me with all of your heart. So you'll never find this road with a half-hearted search. You've got to be determined in looking for it. Well, in verse 13, he says, enter through the narrow gate. Verse 14, he says, for the gate is small and the way is narrow. That leads to life. Notice that the gate is small and it is narrow. It's hard to find. We must enter in by ourselves and with no baggage. So on the broad road, plenty of room. Let's all walk in together. Yeah. But on the narrow road, got to squeeze in one at a time. That's right. And when I'm witnessing to a family, I'll remind them. Now, you can all surrender your life to Jesus today, but you must do it individually. That's right. You can't get saved because your parents got saved. You can't get saved because your spouse got saved. You can't get saved because your kids got saved. You've got to make a personal decision for Jesus Christ. It's a personal relationship Amen. that you've got to make. Amen. And if you don't make that personal relationship, it's not. And you can't bring nothing with you. It requires that we repent of all of our sins and trust fully in Jesus Christ alone to save us. John MacArthur said, the way of, the, of Christ is the way of the cross, and the way of the cross is the way of self-denial. Yes. Wow. So just like I noticed several things about the broad gate, I noticed several things about the narrow gate. Number one, I noticed that we are facing away from it, and we must turn around in order to even see this gate. Remember when I were put on a conveyor belt called life and we're heading towards eternity and we're on the broad road leading to destruction and we have to turn around and go the other way. So we're not looking at the narrow gate. We're not heading towards the narrow gate. We've got to make a course correction in order to get over there. Right. Number two, it is difficult to find this gate because it's so small. The other one is obvious. It's big and everybody's heading that way so it's so obvious where it is. This one is very narrow and very small and it's hard to find. Number three, we must leave all baggage behind to fit inside. You cannot take anything with you. None of your good works are ever going to do any, any uh, favors as far as getting your salvation on Judgment Day. You can't bring in your philosophies and ideologies about who God is. You've got to have the Jesus of the Bible. And he is very narrow. Number four, there are few people entering this narrow gate, so it seems to be the wrong one. Did you notice the picture they put up there? And did you notice everybody's going one way, but the other guy's going the other way? And everybody's going, where in the world is he going? He's going the wrong way. Can't can he see that we're all going this way? Look at that guy over there by himself. What in the world is he doing over there by himself? He's going the wrong way. How, how could he possibly know the right way to go when everybody else is wrong and he's got it right? Yeah, because he watched the warning signs and let the Holy Spirit lead him and say, hey, don't go that way, come this way. And so it seems to be the wrong one, but it's the only right one. Yeah, Number five, the way to this gate is narrow and difficult, making it hard to stay the course. So we heard about three reasons why people bailed out on God when he planted good seed. And yet they said, no, nah, this is too difficult. Let's go another way. And so he says, all along this way, we are faced with countless distractions. 
You know it's hard to stay the course? That's why I'm so grateful for my mentor, Larry Leonard, who when I first got saved, he said, John, time to go to work. Time to serve the Lord. And in the very first week I went in there, John, remember what he told me? Go in here and share your testimony with these kids. I didn't have a clue. I couldn't find nothing in the Bible. I didn't know nothing about the Bible. I didn't know who Paul was. I didn't know the Sermon on the Mount. I didn't know David and Goliath. I have no idea who they are. I mean, I didn't know nothing about the Bible. And I said, these kids probably know the Bible better than I do. He said, don't you know how you got saved? I said, of course I do. He said, go in here and tell the people how you got saved. So I went in there and told him I was going to say, he said, John, I like you, and I like what you had to say. I want you to come into the Sunday school class. Then he told me, next week, I want you to teach the youth. Matthew thinks I threw him to the fire because I had him standing out front hitting out bulletins. He had me teaching the very next week. Within two years of being saved, God had me off in full-time ministry. And thank God that Larry Lennon didn't say, hey, John, just sit on the back row and let somebody else do it. Just pace yourself. You'll never win a race pacing yourself. If the great apostle Paul told me, John, uh, I'm not there where I want to be just yet, but here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to forget those things that are behind me, successes and failures. I got a lot of both back there. I'm trying to forget all that. And I need to keep on straining, reaching forward what lies ahead of me. It's the image of a runner in a marathon straining himself to get across the finish line. And you'll never, ever cross the finish line if you're sitting on the sidelines, sipping Gatorade, complaining about stomach cramps. Yeah, you got to get out there and you got to run the race. And you got to have somebody to cheer you on. All the football teams have cheerleaders. You know, basketball teams have cheerleaders. I don't know why soccer teams don't have cheerleaders. But the football teams, they got them. The, the uh, uh, baseball got them. The basketball got them. And what are they doing there? Why are they cheering everybody on? Hey, let's run, let's run, let's run. Go, go, go. They're trying to encourage them. You need some spiritual cheerleaders to encourage you. And I told you many, many times, everybody needs to have a same-sex accountability partner. If you're a guy, you ought to be meeting with another guy. And you ought to be holding you accountable. If you're a girl, you ought to be meeting with another girl. They ought to be holding you accountable to make sure. Have you read your Bible today? Eh, it's kind of tired. No excuses. Read your Bible. Hey, have you gone to church? Well, I was going to go down to the lake today. No excuses. So I got accountability partners that hold me to the fire. And, and I want them to because I will drift off course so quickly. And there's a lot of temptations. A lot of people out there shout, nah, you've done enough. Sit back and relax. Go ahead and retire. Just enjoy life. There's no retirement from serving God. Right. None whatsoever. So the difficult trail, but then finally, the determined traveler. The determined traveler. And you've got to be determined. So in verse 14, he says that there are few. Few on this path. Lots of them on the other path. Few on this one. This is the road less traveled. This is the road that hardly anybody's on. That was a good depiction with the crowd and the one guy. There might be a couple more than one on that other road, but there's a majority. There's a minority. The majority's on the other path. And you know what we've got to try to do? We've got to try to encourage them. Hey, you want to go this way? If you never read the book Pilgrim's Progress, I would highly encourage that you read it. Pilgrim's Progress by uh, John Bunyan. And it is an allegory about the Christian walk. He's trying to get to the celestial city. He's trying to get to heaven. And so he's pressing out. And they're trying, there's along the way, he talks about all the different things that are keeping him from going that way. And he had some other travelers that went with him, but then they said, hey, this is too difficult. Let's get out of here and go back. And he said, no, I'm going to keep on going. And so sometimes he messed up and he drifted off course and he had to have some people come along and help him out to get back on course again. But get, get Pilgrim's Progress and, and watch it. There's even, they made a little a movie out of it too. And you can watch that. And get it in the updated English version. It'll be a whole lot easier to read. And uh, it is a great allegory. For the longest time, it was the second most popular book in the world behind the Bible. And it's been in print now for over 400 years. Good book. But it's the road less traveled. And he gives a good allegory of what, what we're talking about here today. Flip over there to chapter 22. So you're in Matthew right there, 7. Flip over to chapter 22. And let's talk about, for a minute, some of these, some of these people on this path. And Jesus is trying to call everybody to join him on this path. And I'm trying to do the best I can to help you all out and get you on the right path. Good parables, John. You might, might take a look at this one too. So it's the parable of the, of the marriage feast. And the Bible says, Then Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, 
The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding uh, feast, and they were unwilling to come. It wasn't that they couldn't come. They didn't want to come. Uh, nobody is keeping anybody from coming to Christianity. They just simply choose, I don't want, it's not for me. Sounds too, too difficult for me. I think I'll go another path. And so what it is, is, is God is calling everybody, and He wants them to come. So then, he says in verse 4, Again he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fattened livestock, uh, all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. He said, Man, we got it all ready to go. We put a lot of preparation into it, and I want everybody has been invited to come. And yet they gave excuses. So Jesus pleads with everyone to be saved. He's pleading with you right now. If you're not saved, to be saved. He wants you to be saved. And there's nothing hindering you except for your own desires not to come to Christ. Verse 5, he said, But they paid no attention and went their way. Wow. So this is the second time now. He said, Hey, go, go get them. Tell them we're ready to go. We're waiting on them. They're holding everything up. They said they were unwilling, and now they pay no attention to the people that are trying to tell them, Come on to the wedding. And, uh, and they went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. See, they were distracted. Just like we learned about in the parable this morning, John. Well, we can't go. We've got to work on Sunday. Well, we've got the lake. It's so beautiful. Nice day out today. Let's go to the lake instead. But then some of them, they got angry. So it wasn't just that they said, ah, I'm tied up. I can't make it. They got angry at the people who tried to invite him to come. Good night. Look what they did. Verse uh, 6. And the rest seized his slaves. They grabbed a hold of them and mistreated them and killed them. Wow. And then he says, But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. So there's a lot of persecuted Christians around the world right now. And their persecutors will answer for that. And God is a faithful God, and He will avenge them one day. So He says, I, I take it all notice. I'm seeing everything. Then, verse 8, Then He said to His slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited are not worthy. Wow. And, and, and the indication is, in, in the parable here, He was speaking primarily to the Jews. Tell the Jews to come, the nation of Israel. But they said, We don't want Jesus as the Messiah. We want somebody else. So Jesus says, you're not worthy. So now go to the Gentiles. Yeah. Thank God he said, let's bring some of the Gentiles in too. Do you know who the Gentiles are? The rest of us. Yeah. So there's only, only two real races in the world is Jew and Gentile. Right. So if you not if you weren't born, born a Jew, uh, then you're a Gentile. It doesn't matter whether you're black, white, Asian, Latin, right. we're all Gentiles. So he says they're not worthy. He says, go therefore to the main highways. Go everywhere. That's where the people are. They're hanging on the highways. And many as you find there, invite them to the wedding feast. Then verse 10, those slaves went out to the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. So he thought he could sneak in. He didn't have the robe of righteousness that God's going to give born-again Christians. Verse 12, And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. He was talking about how good he was before. But now, the Word of God silences us. That's what Paul says. The, the law of God is like it stops our mouth. We can't say nothing. So a lot of people have the mindset, When I get to heaven, I'm going to have a conversation with God. You're not going to say a word. You're going to fall on your face. Uh, John, the uh, revelator that wrote the book of uh, John and wrote, wrote some other uh, stuff, he wrote the book of Revelation. The Bible says that even when he saw an angel, he fell down at the angel. And the angel said, hey, don't, don't do that. I'm just a man like you. Get up. And so you're not going to tell God nothing. Be, well, I'm going to ask him a few questions. He ain't going to ask nobody nothing. So this guy was speechless. He couldn't say a thing. And then he says... Um, and, and, and he said, friend, and when he speaks, verse 13, Then the king said to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place he was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Talking about throwing him into hell. Wow. It says, For many are called, but few are chosen. 
Say, Pastor John, help me out here. How can I become one of the chosen? Because I don't want to get thrown out for not having the right robe on. Well, here it is. We must receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. But what does that mean to receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior? Because that's, that's church language. See, when, I was in the, when I was going there and they tell me, I said, what, what are you all talking about? Walk down the aisle? What aisle? You know, I'm not trying to get married. <laughs> and so I had no idea what they were talking about. Be born again? What does that mean? You, know, you tell it to a Hindu, they're going to say, I've been born again so many times, I'm trying to get out of this endless cycle. Because when they think about being born again, they think about reincarnation. So you have to explain, what do you mean by receiving Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Well, it involves repentance. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you all likewise perish. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind, literally is what the word means, changing your mind, but your mindset determines how you behave. So where I used to say how good I was, now I no longer understand, say that I'm good because I now realize only one is good, Jesus. So I stopped talking about how good I am and say I am a sinner and I need a Savior and only Jesus can be my Savior. Then it involves total faith in Jesus Christ alone to save me. So when the Philippian jail asked Paul, uh, hey, what do I got to do to be saved? In uh, uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 31, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Right. Well, well, what does that mean? Believe on Him means that I'm putting my total faith in Him alone. So I'm not trusting in my good works. I'm not trusting in my church membership. I'm not trusting in my baptism. I'm not trusting in that I'm a preacher. I'm not trusting in what I put in the offering plate. I'm not trusting in that I pray and read my Bible every day. I'm not trusting in that I share the gospel with anybody. I'm trusting completely in Jesus Christ and Him alone to save me. So all my hope is found in that Jesus is God in the flesh. He lived a sinless life, completely perfect, didn't do anything wrong in thought, word, or deed, went to the cross, paid my sin debt in full. So when I get there, I'm not going to say, well, I did this plus this. I'm going to say, Jesus is my only hope. And I did what I was, I was told to do. I was told to repent and believe on the gospel. That's what Jesus said to do. Repent and believe on the gospel. So that's repentance and faith. I repented of my sins. I put my faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone to save me. That's my only hope. My only hope. I'm not going to get in because I'm a member of this church. I'm not going to get in because I've been baptized. I'm not going to get in because I do good works. I'm going to get in because Jesus Christ saved my lost soul. And then it finally involves surrendering to His Lordship. So too many people want Jesus to be their Savior, but they don't want him to be his Lord. The Bible knows nothing about that kind of salvation. If you want Jesus to get you into heaven, he must be your Lord. Right, right. Romans 10.9 says, confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. Didn't say confess him as your Savior. He'll be your Savior if you confess him as your Lord. But you know what I got to do? I got to confess it myself. Right. Nobody can confess it for me. I got to do it Personally. Personally. Yeah. And then it says, and, and believe in your heart, I've got to really believe it, and my total faith is in this, that God raised him from the dead. Well, he couldn't have been raised from the dead unless he died. Well, why did he die? He died for my sins. He didn't die for himself. He died for my sins. He was buried for three days, and he rose again. What we'll celebrate on Easter. Right. And so if he was raised, he died and was buried. So when Paul says, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. i got to believe the whole gospel. That Jesus died, was buried, and was raised again. Wow. That's the gospel message. It's just that simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Now listen to me. Everyone is born a sinner on their way to hell. But in his mercy and in his grace, the Lord Jesus Christ allows our courses to be changed. But listen to me now. He commands that we change the course. He will not force anybody. Look what he said there. He said in verse 13. He said, enter through the narrow gate. Enter. That word enter is an imperative. You know what an imperative is? It's a command. So Jesus is saying, I command you to enter through this narrow gate. I'm not encouraging you to do it. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm telling you. This is your only hope. If you don't enter this gate, you'll never get in. Never. Never. So he said, don't just stand there and look at it and admire it and examine it. Enter it. Enter it. Nobody can push me through and nobody's going to pull me through. I got to voluntarily walk through this gate. He says, there's no hindrance to doing this except for you 
refusing to walk in. There's no barrier there. The door's not locked. None of that. So it says, up to you. So Jesus placed two paths before us. And I ask you this question again. Which way will you go? Which way will you go? Only you can decide, nobody else. But listen to me now. To not decide is to make a decision. Say, God, I reject your free gift. I want to stay on this broad road, leading to destruction, even though you made it so clear today what I've got to do. I refuse your free gift. Wow. If somebody goes to hand you something, you have a choice. Either you take it from them, or you just say, I don't want it. It doesn't do any good to go and tell somebody else, hey, uh, somebody's going to give me a $100 bill. And isn't that nice of them to do that? But you didn't take the $100 bill. Well, that's why John 1.12 tells me, as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. I've got to receive the free gift. So I can either say, no thanks, or I can say, thank you, Jesus, and take it. To say, not today, is to say no today. Say, so, well, I might say yes tomorrow. Maybe not. Might not get a chance tomorrow. The Bible tells me that today is the day of salvation. I wouldn't push off my eternity if I really understood what I just said. So God help us to make the right choice today. And you've got to make it for yourself. I've already made it. July 27, 1997. I've never regretted one second of walking on this straight, narrow path. What about you? They're at home. You're still with us? God loves you. He died for you. He wants a personal relationship with you. He will save you right now, right there where you are, in your home, anywhere around the world. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you deeply, and He died for you personally, and He will save you if you'll just repent of your sins and surrender to Jesus Christ be your personal Lord and Savior. Those watching on YouTube, catching us up tomorrow, God loves you too. He died for you, and He will save you. If you waited this long and watched the whole video, God wants you to know He loves you. And He will save you right now, right where you are, if you'll surrender to Him. You don't have to come into a church building and come down to this altar. You can do it right where you are. We had uh, Matt was saved in a restaurant. Right. We didn't say, hey, wait until Sunday and then, uh, and then we'll do it. No, nope, right here in the restaurant. We're not going out by the car. We're not going to go hide out somewhere else. We're going to do it right here at the table in the restaurant. When God's ready to save somebody, wherever you are, that's the best time to do it. Don't put it off for another second. Let's stand for prayer. This is what we call the invitation time of our service. If you've never been to a, a, a church that has an invitation, you might be wondering, what are we doing now? Now what we're going to do is we're going to open up the altar. And this is the time for you to make that choice. And by the way, if you say, not today, what you're doing is you're saying, I refuse it today. So I would encourage you to really don't leave here unless you make that right choice. If you have some more questions, come and ask us about them. And we'll explain it further for you. But don't leave here the same way you walked in. God does not want that, and we don't want that either. So the invitation is that this altar is going to be wide open. Now, you might be saying, well, I went to a church one time, I tried to go down the altar and talk to God, but three people came up and put their hand on my shoulder and asked me a lot of questions. We're not going to do that to you. So you can come down to the altar, and you can just talk to God all by yourself. And nobody's going to bug you, I guarantee you that. Now, if you want us to pray for you, we're happy to do so, and we will pray for you. But you are free to come down to the altar and just talk to God all by yourself. If you can't kneel down at the altar, you can do what my dad did before he went to glory. He just came down and he stood at the altar. He couldn't kneel down. So he stood at the altar every single time. Uh, every single time. So you just do whatever God lays you on your heart to do that. And, uh, and we're going to be praying for you. All right? So let's pray. Then the altar is wide open. Father, in Jesus' name, you're so good to us. We thank you that your word is so clear that even a child can understand it. We thank you that you presented us these two paths. There's no other path, but only these two. And we thank you that one of them will lead us towards you. And we pray there's anybody hearing my voice, either here on campus or watching online, that is on the wrong path leading to destruction. Lord, I pray you'd help them to turn around and go the other way and head towards Jesus. And Father, I know that you'll save anybody anywhere at any time that cries out to you in true, genuine faith and total repentance. So Father, would you speak? Would you move during this time of invitation as you see fit? For us in Jesus' name we pray.